Hey, this is Dave from Medic Test Secrets and welcome back to the Paramedic Static and Dynamic Cardiology Rhythm Review. This is video number two for bradycardia. So we're gonna go through the ACLS rhythms that you can see as part of your static and dynamic cardiology. So the bradycardia rhythms include sinus bradycardia, first degree AV block, second degree AV block type one, second degree AV block type two, and the third degree AV block. Let's go through sinus bradycardia first. Yes! So sinus bradycardia, it originates in the ESA node. There's a P wave before every QRS, same size and shape. There's a normal PR interval of 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. The QRS is going to be the same size and shape. It's going to be narrow, less than 0.12 seconds. It's going to have a regular R to R interval and a regular P to P interval. The thing that makes sinus bradycardia sinus bradycardia is that the rate is less than 60. So everything else about the rhythm will be normal. As you can see here, all our P waves are going to be the same. They're all going to be upright and they're all going to look the same. Our PR interval is going to be normal, right? Our QRS is going to be narrow and it's just our rate is going to be slow, less than 60. So the treatment for sinus bradycardia it usually doesn't require rhythm specific treatment. So as with any rhythm, right, we want to consider whether our patient is stable or unstable. I use cash as a mnemonic for that. Uh, chest pain, altered mental status, shortness of breath and shock, hypotension and heart failure. So if the patient's stable, as with most of these rhythms, they will be very similar in treatment. It's through the ACLS bradycardia algorithm, which is a little different now than it was a couple years ago. But for a stable patient, we'll monitor and observe. And for an unstable patient, we can do atropine one milligram every three to five minutes with a max of three milligrams. If the atropine is not effective, we can consider transcutaneous pacing or a dopamine infusion, five to 20 mics per kilogram per minute, titrated to response, or epinephrine, two to 10 mics per minute. And then if we exhaust one of those resources, we can obtain expert consultation. The, the important things to take note of here are that this one milligram every three to five minutes used to be 0 0.5, which has changed. And this uh, dopamine infusion dose of five to 20 used to be two to 20. So you might still see this in some places, but the new ACLS guidelines are one milligram every three to five minutes and five to 20 mugs per kilogram per minute. Next, we have a first degree AV block. So the first degree AV block, basically what you have here is an extended PR interval. So the distance between your P wave and your R wave is longer than it's supposed to be. No. So if any, if you're familiar with the heart block poem, which is very helpful for remembering these blocks, if the R is far from the P, then you have a first degree. So the site of origin for this rhythm, it depends on the underlying rhythm, right? You can have a first degree AV block with various rhythms, but they're usually atrial in nature because um, the P wave indicates that the electrical impulse originated somewhere from the atria. The site of delay is between the atria and the bundle of hiss. For the P waves, they were, there will be a P wave before every QRS, usually the same size and shape. But the PR interval, this is what is going to make it a first degree AV block, is greater than 0.20 seconds. The QRS is usually the same size and shape, usually narrow at less than 0.12 seconds. The P to P interval, um, it can vary depending on the underlying rhythm and the R to R interval can vary depending on the underlying rhythm. The rate also can vary depending on the un underlying rhythm. So what you wanna look for to say that you have a first degree AV block is this PR interval here is going to be prolonged or greater than 0.20 seconds. So treatment for first degree AV block, another rhythm that doesn't really require rhythm specific treatment. Um, if the patient has, has signs of being unstable or poor perfusion, uh, then you would treat it with the bradycardia algorithm just like the other bradycardic rhythms. All right, next we have the second degree AV block type one. This is can be either called a Mobitz one or a Winky Bach. To identify second degree type one, the heart block poem, longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a Winky Bach, okay? So 
Uh, one of the big things, right, is with this rhythm, the R to R interval is irregular. So what I like to do is I like to look for that dropped beat, right? You see these marching along. Okay, looks like the next one should be right here, but it's not, right? So this is our dropped beat. So what I do to, to differentiate between a second degree type one and a second degree type two is I look at the QRS complex after and the QRS complex before. When I look at those, I look at the P waves before these QRS complexes. Now, as you can see, the P wave from the complex before has a long PR interval. And the P wave from the complex after has a normal or short PR interval. So this lets me know that the P wave is getting longer and then we're dropping a B here and then the PR interval is going back to normal. And then you can continue to look, you see this PR interval is longer, this PR interval is longer, and then it keeps getting longer until you drop a beat. But the quickest way to identify a type one is look for that drop beat, look at the QRS after, the QRS before. If the PR intervals are different, then it, you probably have a type one second degree AB block. So the site of origin for this rhythm is in the atria. The block is in the AV junction. It's a progressive block, which means that the, um, the block is getting longer until the electrical impulse does not make it through the AV junction, and that's when you drop a beat. The P wave, there's at least one for every QRS. Um, same size and shape. The PR interval, again, becomes progressively longer until the QRS is dropped. The QRS is usually going to be the same size and shape, usually narrow. Um, the rhythm is regular P to P interval, but irregular R to R interval. And that's because of that dropped beat that we have when that electrical impulse doesn't make it through the AV junction. And finally, the atrial and the ventricular rates can vary. So the treatment is the same as the other bradycardic rhythms. Um, you're going to determine whether your patient is stable or unstable using cash. And then if they're stable, you'll monitor and observe. And if they're unstable, you can do your atropine. And if that's not effective, either pacing, dopamine, uh, infusion, or epinephrine. All right, next we have the second degree AV block type 2, uh, or a Mobitz 2. So for this rhythm, we go back to, again, having an irregular R to R interval, right? So now I see, okay, this is where my beat should land. And again, we have a dropped beat. So I'm gonna look at the QRS after, the QRS before, and I'm gonna look at the PR intervals. So the PR intervals are the same. Because the PR intervals are the same, I know that this is gonna be a type two AV block. So the site of origin again is the atria. This is another block in the AV junction. It's an intermittent block. It's not a progressive block. Um, there's at least one P wave for every QRS. They are the same size and shape. The PR interval equal throughout and it may be normal or prolonged until that drop beat. So your PR intervals will be equal for, for every QRS complex and then you will drop a beat. The rhythm, uh, the P to P interval, it, it can vary according to the uh, underlying rhythm, whether it's uh, prolonged or short, it should be regular. The R to R interval is gonna be irregular because we have that drop beat. The rate, um, the atrial and the ventricular rates can vary. Um, this can be a life-threatening arrhythmia. Um, and then we have ratios of blocks. So if you have two P waves for one QRS, then you have a two to one block ratio. If you have three P waves for every QRS, you have a three to one block ratio. Four P waves for every QRS, you have a four to one block ratio. And um, a varying number of P waves to one QRS is a varying block ratio. Treatment for a second degree type two. So the difference here is you have more of a chance that the patient is gonna be unstable. You could have less perfusing beats. These, the higher level block you get into, second degree type two and third degree block, the 
the more of a chance you have for hemodynamic compromise. So you're going to determine whether or not your patient is stable or unstable. If your patient is unstable, uh, you can consider trialing atropine. Do it while you're preparing for pacing. If you can get the pacer pads on and get the pacer ready before you can get an IV and give atropine, then that's what you want to do. If you do go the atropine route and it's not effective, then you will move to pacing or dopamine or epinephrine and then obtain expert consultation. Third degree AV block. So if P's and Q's don't agree, then you have a third degree. So the difference here is, right, these P waves and the QRS complexes are not associated in any way, right? So the P waves are kind of like the atria are doing their own thing and the ventricles are doing their own thing. So you have your P waves and then you have your QRS. So your QRS, your, your ventricles are just, they have their own set pattern. Your atria have their own set pattern. They are not associated. There's a signal originating in the atria that is causing the atria to contract. And then because that AV junction is completely blocked off, the, ve the ventricles have established their own pacemaker somewhere below the AV junction that is pacing the ventricles. And that is why a third degree block usually has a very slow ventricular rate. Because when the ventricles or below the AV junction is the inherent pacemaker, it's going to be significantly slower than if the SA node was the uh, primary pacemaker. Site of origin is the P waves are originating in the atria and the QRSs are originating in the ventricles. Uh, they will be wide and bizarre. The P waves can look normal or they can look abnormal. So the site of the block is somewhere between the atria and the ventricles. P waves, no relationship to the QRS. Um, they can be the same size and shape or, or they could not be. The PR interval. It appears to vary, but there really is no PR interval because the, the electrical impulse that caused the P wave is not traveling down the heart and depolarizing the ventricles. So they are not associated. The QRS um, will usually be the same size and shape, wide, bizarre, and greater than 0.12 seconds because it originates, that electrical impulse originates in the ventricles. So the rhythm is going to be uh, regular for the P to P interval, regular for the R to R interval, and the rate. So the atrial rate will usually be between 60 and 100, the ventricular rate usually 20 to 40, and this is a life-threatening arrhythmia, and it can progress to a lethal arrhythmia. These patients tend to be unstable because the ventricular rate is so slow that the, the, the heart is not able to pump out enough oxygenated blood to meet the body's uh, needs. It's not able to pump blood effectively. These patients typically tend to be unstable. So you're going to want to get this patient on the, the pacer pads very quickly. The reason why I have atropine listed here first is because when you're testing for registry, they go by the ACLS algorithm. And ACLS puts atropine at the top of the algorithm or whether your patient's in a third degree block or a sinus bradycardia, no matter you know whether your patient's stable or unstable, the algorithm is what it is. So it's just important to, to note, like, you know, I would consider a trial of atropine, uh, one milligram. However, because this patient is significantly unstable and in a high level block, I would move quickly to transcutaneous pacing uh, because that is what's going to be most effective and best for the patient. If the pacing or the atropine are ineffective, you could try uh, dopamine or epinephrine and uh, obtain expert consultation. All right, so if you need any more paramedic psychomotor exam help, uh, I have other resources available. You can check out medictestsecrets.com or go ahead and click that link in, this, in the description. And if you got any value from this video or it helped you to understand blocks a little bit more in any way, I'm working to try to get more videos up here that are helpful to help people prepare for their registry exam. So 
so go ahead and uh, like or leave me a comment let me know what is your biggest concern or what are you struggling with the most as you're preparing for your paramedic psychomotor or cognitive exam